Welcome to another scholarship highlight brought to you by the Center for Firearms Law at Duke University School of Law. This series is a part of the Center's broader efforts to deepen the scholarly discussion of firearms law by engaging directly with some of the many scholars and practitioners who are engaging, who are producing innovative and insightful work in the area. I'm Jake Charles, Executive Director of the Center, and this week we're joined by David Patton, the Executive Director of the Federal Defenders of New York. We're going to be talking with him about his article, Criminal Justice Reform and Guns, the Irresistible Movement Meets the Immovable Object, recently published in the Emory Law Journal. Thanks for being here, David. My pleasure. So first off, in a nutshell, can you just tell us what the article is about? Uh, sure, it's about federal uh, gun possession prosecutions, um, which uh, increased steeply uh, in the 90s due to some Department of Justice sort of formalized programs, and I talk about um, uh, some of the criticisms uh, of those prosecutions and what the prospects for change might be uh, in this era when there's a lot of talk about criminal justice reform. Yeah. So what was kind of the impetus for you to write this? Uh, well, it's an area I've been interested in uh, personally for a long time because as a federal public defender, we see a lot of these cases. Um, uh, they are uh, uh, simple gun possession cases, so guns that are found by local police uh, here in New York, the NYPD uh, in New York City, uh, can be for any number of reasons. Somebody is stopped on the street, or it's found in an apartment, or in the trunk of a car. Um, uh, and uh, because the local authorities have a formalized program with the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, at least in certain counties, uh, they ship those cases to federal court for the express purpose of imposing higher sentences than they would otherwise get in state court. And so um, having had a lot of clients on the receiving end of these prosecutions, uh, it's always been an area of interest and an area of concern for me. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, it's, it's part of my everyday existence, uh, in, in, in my practice of law. Yeah. And so you talked a little bit about kind of the blossoming movement for criminal justice reform, but who, who do you see this article as being in conversation with, um, other than those conversations or maybe who in those conversations or, or what kind of practical changes are you hoping for with the article? Well, yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. There was a lot of scholarly activity uh, around these prosecutions in the late 90s and in the 2000s when they first began. So um, uh, these were formalized programs that really began in the 90s and they were new uh, and they broke with a lot of traditions. There were initially a lot of federalism critiques. Why is the federal government getting involved in what has historically just been a matter for state and local authorities? There's no real obvious interstate connection other than the guns themselves having traveled in, in interstate commerce, but there's no requirement that a person have carried the gun across state lines or engaged in a crime uh, with the guns. It's purely their status as having a prior felony conviction that makes them subject, in most cases, there are other statuses that, that could trigger federal jurisdiction, but that's the big one. Uh, uh, these are commonly known as felon in possession prosecutions. So there was a lot of scholarship early on about why are the feds involved in this? Um, uh, a lot of criticism about the stark racial disparities from the very beginning, there have been extreme racial disparities in who is prosecuted uh, in federal court. Uh, to this day, about three quarters of all the prosecutions are against uh, men of color. And, um, and then you had uh, researchers studying the impact. So the, the, the rationale for the prosecutions that the Department of Justice espoused was crime reduction, that, that this was part of an effort to reduce violent crime. And so you had researchers, some, some very prominent statisticians and researchers, uh, engage in work studying, well, is that true? Uh, ha have these prosecutions reduced crime rates? Um, and so there was all of this 
conversation going on. And, but frankly, for about the past 10 years, there hasn't been much of that. Um, uh, I think it's just sort of become accepted that despite all of the criticisms, the prosecutions continue to pace and it's just become our new normal. And so there actually hasn't been a lot of conversation. And so I guess um, when you ask, who am I in conversation with? <clears throat> I suppose I'm hoping to, to reinvigorate uh, the conversation because a lot of very talented and smart scholars and researchers were focused uh, on this topic uh, for, for a while in the 2000s mostly, um, but haven't been so recently. Yeah. So you talk in the article about the agreement um, among both the kind of the right side of the of the perspective on how we deal with guns and crime and the left side of how we deal with guns and crime. And and there's agreement that we should focus on harsh penalties for those caught committing crimes with guns or unlawfully possessing guns. Can you talk about that agreement and how you think that's shaped the enforcement trends? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say there's total agreement. I disagree, obviously, sure. uh, and, and many others do. Um, but in that sort of Venn diagram where there's overlap and where, and where there has been political support for these prosecutions, um, on the right, it has come generally from, from both just a typical law and order uh, viewpoint and when it comes to guns particularly, um, a pretty clear effort to forestall broader gun control measures. So the initial Operation Trigger Lock in the early 90s was announced under the first Bush administration right at a time when there was increasing support for broader gun control. And this was a way on the right to forestall that broader regulation by saying, look, we have laws on the books, we just need to enforce them. And here we go, we're going to ramp up this enforcement policy. And so you don't need to worry about the broader gun control regulation, the laws on the books suffice. And on the left, um, you have uh, a, 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 obviously a, a strong gun control contingent um, and uh, uh, I think have always seen uh, this as maybe part of that, not necessarily recognizing it as a replacement or um, a strategy on the right to forestall broader gun control regulation. And also supporting these prosecutions is a way to, um, as Daniel Richmond has talked about, um, uh, a way to shield uh, the left from criticism that they're not actually making use of the laws that are on the books. Um, and so there was that uh, overlap in uh, from both the left and the right that really led to these prosecutions taking off. Yeah. So you mentioned Operation Trigger Lock. Can you talk more about that program, maybe some of the history that you've talked about, its ambitions, and then its consequences? Sure. So it was uh, initially announced in 1991 uh, under then Attorney General Dick Thornburg uh, under the first Bush administration. Um, none of this was prompted by a new law uh, from Congress. So the law on the book prohibiting somebody who's previously been convicted of a felon from thereafter possessing a gun had been on the books since the late 60s, but there just hadn't been this formal federal prosecution initiative. And the Operation Trigger Lock uh, announced by Attorney General Thornburg changed that. Um, but it really took off later in the 90s under the Clinton administration um, in the Eastern District of Virginia and in Richmond in particular. And the head of the Richmond office uh, was Jim Comey, now famous former FBI director. Um, and they took what was initially announced by Thornburg as this effort to get, I think some of the language they used was the worst of the worst or the most violent criminals off the streets. Um, uh, Comey in the Eastern District of Virginia really expanded it to just say, we're going after, we're going to prosecute anyone who's not allowed to have a gun in federal court and seek the stiffest penalties possible. And those are much higher penalties typically 
than you'll find in state court. And that was known as Project Exile. Uh, exile because if you're convicted in federal court and sentenced, you're shipped off to some federal prison far away. Um, criminologists uh, have criticized a lot of the um, theory behind this um, in terms of it being a good idea to exile people and uh, take them away from their family ties and community ties in terms of what that does to recidivism rates. Um, but that was the idea. And for the reasons we've already talked about, uh, the Clinton Democrats embraced it, uh, the right embraced it, and soon um, you had just an extraordinary increase in these simple possession cases being brought in federal court to the point where now and for quite some time, it's been the third highest category of federal criminal prosecutions behind only drugs and uh, uh, immigra criminal immigration prosecutions. Yeah, and so you just talked a little bit there and you did in the article too about how the program was designed as one to go after the most dangerous offenders with guns and it turned into, or maybe it's, it's kind of turned into over the years, more of a operation to process felon in possession cases. Why do you think that shift happened? Is it, I, I can think of at least a couple explanations for it. One is like a genuine belief that um, those that are not lawfully entitled to possess guns are actually dangerous with guns. Two, that it's easy to say you're doing something when you have a really easy to prove charge and so you can point to all the statistics um, and, and make it seem like you're doing a lot. Um, and then maybe we could think of some, you know, even worse motives um, for these kind of uh, prosecutions, but why do you think the program morphed? I mean, again, assuming the best motivations, there's a genuine belief that it would in fact impact violent crime rates. I mean, uh, less generous motivations would have to do with it being part of a package of what was known as the Southern strategy uh, of, of really Republican law and order politics nationalizing law and order politics that really took off in the 80s and gained steam in the 90s and and Clinton Democrats sort of co-opted that that was you know in terms of uh look I'm not a political scientist but I grew up in the era and it was known as sort of triangulation of, of that was a way for Clinton Democrats to sort of move more to the middle to show that they too could be tough on crime and as you say it's something you can do and it's quite easy Right. So from a pure agency standpoint, it doesn't involve a great uh, deal of resources. It's not heavy investigative work. As a U.S. attorney's office, you're simply plucking uh, cases out of state court. These are the decision here is not between somebody being prosecuted or not being prosecuted. The, the decision is, are they going to be prosecuted in the state courts or are we going to bring them here for more severe treatment in federal courts? And, um, and as you said, that's not hard to do. Uh, they, they simply bring them over and, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's easy fishing. Um, uh, I will say also just anecdotally in my experience, certainly in the uh, early and mid 2000s in particular, I would hear a lot from the US Attorney's Office that they brought them over because it was good experience for their young new prosecutors, their general crimes unit prosecutors. Th th these can uh, oftentimes result in trials. Did the person know the gun was in the closet of the apartment? Did they know it was in the trunk of the car? And so, um, uh, and you have NYPD percipient witnesses, unlike many other types of federal prosecutions where you have years of wiretaps or videotape, there are sometimes real issues to litigate. And so it can be experience for their young prosecutors to get trial experience or suppression hearing experience. Interesting. So one thing that you do in the article is marshal the numerous criticisms of specifically these types of federal prosecutions. Um, can you briefly just describe those for the listeners? Sorry, uh, give that to me again. Yeah, the, 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 the criticisms of these types of prosecutions. 
Yeah, well, I, I think um, we've touched on some of them. One is certainly the extraordinary racial disparity. Uh, and that's been there from the beginning, even with Project Exile. Uh, back in the 90s in Richmond, there were equal protection challenges that were brought. Uh, the uh, number of black defendants was, some, was well over 90% of, of all of these cases. And you see that replicated in districts uh, around the, the country. So there is this extraordinary racial disparity. So this is part of the story that's become part of the mainstream discourse now, whether it's the new Jim Crow or other criticisms of racial disparity and mass incarceration in America, this fits into that story for sure. Um, the other, uh, I think that goes to the heart of why these prosecutions exist in the first place is um, do they in fact work to reduce violent crime, right? That's the stated rationale. It's not so much a retributive rationale, right? In fact, there's a constitutional right to possess a firearm in this country. So there is nothing inherent about possessing a firearm. At least uh, I know people differ on the policy views of that, but as a legal matter, there's nothing inherently unlawful about possessing a firearm. It's based on your status um, as a prior felon. And so, the, the real justification for bringing these cases into federal court is that, uh, according to its proponents, it reduces violent crime. And in, but in fact, a lot, the most rigorous studies that have been done, and again, they haven't been done in quite some time, but the ones that were done in particularly in the early and mid 2000s showed that in fact, they did not have an impact. So exile, which was so touted in Richmond, um, in the late 90s, one of the reasons why it took off and was replicated around the country was be because people said, look at the murder and violent crime rate in Richmond before the program was implemented and look at it after and we see this steep drop in violent crime. Well, <laughs> some, some good researchers and statisticians took a look at that and they said, actually, it, it's the common problem of a correlation but not causation that um, there are lots of reasons to think it actually had little to no impact uh, in Richmond or anywhere else. That in Richmond, you had a little bit of a reversion to the mean because uh, violent crime had spiked the year before. But you can also look around the country in places that at that time didn't have these programs and they too saw steep declines in violent crime. Um, and so it was probably, in all likelihood, part of just a broader wave of, of reduced violent crime that we were seeing for any number of reasons in the late 90s and into the 2000s. Uh, and of course, trying to measure why crime rates go up or down has been an incredibly complicated uh, question for researchers of all types for all time. Uh, and we still really have no idea why crime rates go up and down. But um, what we do know from the best studies that are out there is that there's at least no evidence that these prosecutions have an impact on violent crime. And so if that's the main justification and you're seeing um, real downsides in terms of racial disparity and mass incarceration. And there are others I haven't mentioned, the critiques of federalism, civil liberties critiques about it leading to more searches and seizures. Um, if you've got a lot of downside, but no real evidence that there's upside, then, then why, are, why, are, why are we engaging in, in them. And, and so that's sort of where I land in, in terms of the balancing the pros and cons of, of these prosecutions. Yeah, and so, so you turn at the end of the article um, to possible solutions to these problems. And you talk about ways that we might be able to see changes in Congress, in the judiciary, and in the executive. Can you talk about why you think the solutions from the executive branch are probably our best hope for seeing, um, seeing a resolution here? Um, so it's hard to imagine um, legislation, realistically, legislation that would be passed that would scale back on these prosecutions. You've certainly seen plenty of discussion about 
criminal justice reform in the federal system and steps that have been taken in the First Step Act, for instance, which did in fact um, uh, uh, make some reforms to some of the more draconian penalty provisions. We haven't gotten into all of the details of the different variations of federal gun prosecutions, but aside from the simple possession, there are ways that people can get decades and decades in prison. Uh, in federal court for gun possession cases. And some of those have, have been nibbled away at, some of the more extreme sentences. Um, but the basic law that is on the book, on the books that if you have a prior felony conviction, it is against the law to possess a gun, um, uh, that's not likely to go anywhere. Um, in the courts, uh, so in the judiciary, you've seen again, some nibbling away at the extremes. Uh, there have been some prominent cases recently that have scaled back on the Armed Career Criminal Act, sort of narrowing what counts uh, for uh, really severe enhanced penalties. Um, you've seen a, a recent case in Rahafe that, that um, uh, made it uh, it's slightly harder for the government to show a required mens rea about the offending status. That is, the person has to know that they have the offending status that makes it unlawful for them to possess a firearm. But those are fairly minor tweaks. And what we're, we're left with is probably nothing that I can see on the horizon that would fundamentally shift either from the legislature or from, from the courts that would scale back on, on these prosecutions. The big thing that could have done so that was foreclosed early on in the courts was having a higher interstate uh, commerce connection uh, other than just having a gun that was made in one place and found in another place, which is, is pretty widespread. So um, that's why I say really, these programs began with the Department of Justice. They didn't begin with a new law. They didn't begin with some new court case, some new interpretation that expanded the ability of federal prosecutors to do this. It really just came out of a policy decision within the Department of Justice and individual US attorney's offices. And so if we are likely to see a scaling back on these pros prosecutions, it's gonna probably have to come from that place. Um, and so, We've certainly seen in some states around the country and in, in state and local jurisdictions, a movement to have so-called pro progressive prosecutors. Of course, those are elected uh, prosecutors as opposed to the federal system where they're appointed. Um, so it'll just be interesting to see if we get any movement, if there's a change in administration, uh, whether or not you might have some push to have this more progressive prosecutor movement we've seen in state and local jurisdictions in the federal system. Might you have a progressive prosecutor in a US attorney's office, which thus far, as far as I've been able to see, we haven't had anywhere ever. Um, uh, and would they take this on as an issue? Would they scale back on these prosecutions? Yeah. Well, that's really interesting and a good way to end it on solutions. So thanks for um, joining and talking about your article. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.